Okay, I think we are ready to begin. Uh, sorry for the slight delay, just five minutes. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, my name is Peter Sudorko, I'm the University Librarian. I won't be interfering too much in Paul's presentation because um, I know you're here to listen to him, not me. But it is my great pleasure to, to introduce Paul, Paul Letters. Uh, Paul has uh, a background in history and has studied education, international affairs and journalism as well at Cardiff, Oxford as well as uh, Hong Kong uh, where he has also been a senior researcher here at Hong Kong U. Uh, he's published, uh, he's a freelance author in, and has published in the South China Morning Post, uh, IB Review and uh, other magazines. He's currently working on a second novel, but he's here to talk to us tonight on his first novel, uh, the historical novel, which is A Chance Kill, uh, which strikes a particular chord for me because I have uh, a Polish background mm. and um, I think there's some history with my grandmother as well, but right. maybe that's for another time. Um, so it is an historical novel and I think Paul's talk is is perhaps uh, based around the book, of course, but it, it does have a theme, as you can see, when is fiction, not fiction, when is non-fiction, fiction. Uh, and as you will also see in the displays, uh, Paul's book was a number one bestseller on page one and Dimmick's um, top sellers, uh, even outstripping Fifty Shades of Grey, which is uh, pretty <laughs> pretty remarkable. Well, briefly is, is good enough. <laughs> Uh, the, the book itself has been well researched, obviously, um, being an historical novel, uh, and has been critically well received as well. So with that, I'm going to ask you to welcome Paul and uh, give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you all for coming. Sorry I was a couple of minutes late. Yeah, I, I'm maybe unusual. I just began writing five years ago. It was the, the onset of disability that that's kind of ignited my you only live once um, gene. I'd always wanted to write and kind of never, never, never got around to it. Um, I did a master's, as Peter said, at Hong Kong U and the literary journalism in particular um, really uh, kind of got me, got me focused on writing, um, like you say, for, for different magazines in the South China. I still teach part-time at high school. As I teach history, global development and theory of knowledge, which is how do you know what you know or what you think you know, which is going to kind of come into this, this talk a bit. Um, OK. Um, so let's just, oh, yes. Um, in Hong Kong bookshops, when I first arrived in Hong Kong in 2001, I, uh, it was new to me, the idea of under the heading of history in the non-fiction section that you might find historical novels and journalistic um, books as well, as you, as you do sometimes. And at first, I just thought that was strange. And now, as you may tell from what I'm about to say, I can, I can see some sense in that. I can't read historical fiction because I find the real thing so much more interesting by historian Antonia Fraser, who did, actually in the 1950s, write uh, two or three historical novels, but I guess she keeps that quiet now. And she's echoing um, Mendelstam, Russian poet, once again the writer stains the tree of history with his thoughts. Using the analogy of a tree is maybe, uh, uh, perhaps implies a more rooted idea of history, a more definite idea than I would generally uh, subscribe to. Um, but I'll be, sorry, I'll be asking, can some historical fiction be considered as a legitimate contribution to the historical narrative? Can it be considered uh, a legitimate representation of truth? This 11 days ago was in the New York Times. It's a book review. So the reviewer complaining about the, the acknowledgements at the end. Too much information about the sources. I don't want to know where everything comes from. And unsurprisingly, uh, on, the, on the comments online below the article, there were lots of historical novelists sort of piling in there and saying things like this. particularly the final comment I want to pick up on. I include these references. So this is the historical novelist saying, justifying why they do include references out of respect to the past I'm attempting to represent. Um, we may not 
be able to, as Henry James lamented, capture the consciousness of a bygone era, but we can demonstrate that we care enough to try. Um, yeah, that idea of representing the past. Um, and of course, sorry. Um, a good historical novel offers a representation of the past, past, and is that so far away from what a historian offers, uh, an interpretation of the past? There are differences, of course. And it's not just historians and novelists who interpret and reinterpret the past. This was an op-ed I wrote a couple of months ago in, in the South China, um, picking up on how China had then, in March, recently announced how they were going to commemorate um, the end of World War II, together with Russia, joint um, celebrations, I think it's probably a fair word, but perhaps they'd say commemorations, um, marking how they fought, uh, they stood together in World War II. And of course they were on the same side in World War II. Um, but in 1939, uh, Russia you know, made a, a deal with the, the Japanese. China had obviously, obviously been fighting the Japanese for years before Russia. China, uh, Russia had a brief border war with Japan, and at the end of that, made a peace deal. And Russia was at peace you know, with Japan until August 1945, after the first atomic bombs dropped. So this is a reinterpretation of history, that those two countries were so close. But don't get me wrong, I can see why you'd want to do that. I think uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's valid, it's just a different interpretation. Um, I can see the frustrations with the dominance of the Western interpretation of World War II, particularly the kind of Hollywood version of America winning the war, including the war in Asia, when in reality less than 400,000 Americans um, were killed during World War II, and something like uh, 10 to 20 million Chinese and estimates of 27 million um, in, in the Soviet Union were, were killed. So and that's obviously Hollywood puts forward generally a, a different interpretation to the, to the one we're getting here. So I'm just trying to say that in non-fiction and, and just in current affairs, there's different interpretations of what happened in the past. In historical novels, there's different interpretations. In, in non-fiction history, there's different interpretations. Um, just... Um, yes, fiction may distort reality, even where it aims to be historically accurate. But... It's not just fiction that perhaps that, that does that. I wonder if there'd be any guesses just in your head, perhaps, um, unless you want to shout out, you're welcome to, of which novelist these quotations are taken from. Not particularly famous quotations, I have to admit. There's another slide from another writer. I'll come back and tell you that in a moment. Well, who wrote this? Just get a flavour of it. It doesn't matter if you don't get to the end. So we're talking about JFK's um, grave. So we'll take each in turn. So this this was written by Graham Greene. So lots of um, uh, metaphors, uh, similes. Um, but this, he didn't write this in one of his novels. These, these are all taken from his non-fiction. Graham Greene was first and foremost a journalist. So was Hemingway, so was Dickens, so was Orwell. And they all remained journalists through their novel writing careers. So some of the questions I'm looking at is how, how does one overlap, if at all, into the other? Non-fiction writers often use fiction techniques in journalism. So this is what we'd call literary journalism, where he's using the this, this sort of metaphorical, um, uh, poetic prose that, that you, you'd, you associate with fiction. Um, for those whose training is non-fiction, and that would include journalists and historians, can they bring high standards of truth to fiction writing? So Green um, writing The Quiet American, it's almost a, a documentary style uh, novel. Of course, it's not a historical novel. He was writing in 1954, really predicting what was going to happen in Indochina and Vietnam, and, also, and, and did happen in the years that, that followed that. Our man in Havana does a similar job uh, for Cuba. Green's foreshadowing is, is on a grand scale, jumping from one place of political turmoil to, an, to another. And this, of course, is in, in, in his novels. Um, as well as his journalism. So, 
I'm also going to ask, did their, did their fiction writing for writers like, like Green and, and um, other uh, writer, uh, novelists come journalists, or journalists come novelists, I should say, did fiction writing affect their journalism, like we saw with Green's grand prose on the previous slide? So they all wrote what we call literary journalism, if, it, I don't know if anyone in the room is familiar with that. But um, it's where you would use fiction techniques in, in writing journalistic articles, or it could be, could be books. Um, but this, uh, well, I'll show you a newspaper article in, in a moment. So you would, you, you would set the scene. You would describe a scene. You would have a clear setting. You would have characters. Often the person writing the article makes themselves a character. It's very different to other forms of journalism, of course, where they're told not to be that and to, and to let the reader um, in, not be affected kind of, uh, by, by the writer. So literary journalism, you would have dialogue, not just quoting somebody but actual conversations between people. It's, it's rarer now, but you still see or you see elements of it in, in journalism today in, in, the longer, in the longer form. The journalism and fiction may be, may be sort of different lanes, but perhaps they can be heading at times at least in the same direction. So this, this uh, just to show you some dialogue from, from a journalistic article was, was obviously what was up on the screen earlier. Um, this is where you kind of get on day one in journalism school, at least in literary, on the literary journalism course, given this article. And in many ways, of course, you know, half a century old, it's, it, it, maybe it wouldn't be printed like that today. But Jimmy Breslin, who won the Pulitzer Prize um, and won award, several awards for this article, he was trying to take a different angle on the assassination of JFK. Of course, there's so much media coverage, and most of it was saying the same thing as each other. So he went to talk to, this is an extract, of course, from a longer article, although the article's only a 1,000 words. So the op-ed that, that I wrote the, about uh, Russia and China was about 900. So it's, it, it's not so different. Although if I sent an article like this to South China with that amount of dialogue in it, I don't think they, they, they go for it, to be honest, these days. Um, so, in journalism like this, the dialogue won't be verbatim. If he, if he was there talking uh, to, the, to the grave diggers with his notepad, interviewing them, he would have got a different reaction from them. They would have been less natural. So, I mean, occasionally it might be verbatim, but, but often it's... It's not. It's a reconstruction of the conversation. This is a journalistic article. It was in a newspaper. That is not word for word what was said. Um, so, you know, it, is that so far away from when a historical novelist, I mean a historical novelist who's trying to be true to the history, of course, um, when, when he or she is recreating conversations without knowing for sure what was said between you know, real, um, real people. When I was um, writing my, my uh, uh, first novel, it's uh, set in Europe from 1939 to 42. It starts in, in um, Warsaw, moves around Paris, London, and the second half of the book is set in and around Prague. And in the middle of writing, I'd already written most of it, uh, this book uh, came out by Laurent Binet. Um, and he wrote a book about writing a novel about the assassination of Heydrich. And uh, it's very different. To, you know, it's part, part, sections of it are read like a novel, and sections of it um, he uh, makes his case about how you can't, you can't write history as a novel. Um, and I'll be using him, referring to him a few, a few times in later slides. So in the second bullet point there, he says that you can only faithfully reconstruct dialogue from, all, from three sources, audio recordings, film recordings, or stenography notes, and he picks holes in the, in the latter. But I'd pick holes in the other two as well. Audio recordings, can you always be sure you've got the whole picture there? And especially you know, the people's reactions, even on film. If you've got one camera moving from one person to another, if you had film of a conversation between two or three or four historical figures and the camera moved from one to another, um, is that 100%? Are you getting every nuance, every facial expression, which, of course, can, how, how something is said or the facial expression, as they say it, can, can affect the meaning? Yeah, I, I'm not saying it's... Of course, these are uh, uh, very useful sources, but the idea that, that they'd be 100%, I'd, I'd question. 
So yeah, fiction can flesh out history, I, I'm suggesting, how flesh out an interpretation or at least a representation of history, perhaps I should say. And isn't that what history is? A kaleidoscope of different interpretations which vary according to whoever puts their view, their eye to the viewfinder. Um, as historians, we all just see things at least slightly different, sometimes radically different. Historical novelists reconstruct uh, dialogue scenes, and I set one in the Natural History Museum, which was used, as it's seen on the right there, as uh, it's been referred to as a secret agent's war, uh, sorry, a secret agent's toy shop during World War II. So lots of gadgets were made there, exploding rats, um, so that you could uh, exploding, um, um, sorry, uh, horse manure, so that you could put these things out. Horse manure, for example, just on a road, a tank goes over it, it blows up. Even if they see it coming, um, you know, it's a problem. So and, and Churchill visited, was taken on tours here by the by the top brass. And that the Diplodocus, if you've been there, you, you, you know, you'd, you'd recognise that. The Diplodocus is, stayed there through World War II. A lot of the exhibits were taken away, but, but some weren't. And they put out an exhibition around that Diplodocus for Churchill and, and other dignitaries to demonstrate some of the things they'd come up, they'd come up with. And Churchill has one scene in my novel, and again, it's, don't need to read all of this, but I'm just trying to, to, to make the point how, how novelist then, this is me now, um, putting words in Churchill's mouth and other, that all the, all the characters are real, are real characters. There's M, Gubbins will later become the inspiration for, for M uh, of James Bond uh, fame, head of the special operations executive who will drop um, enemy agents seem to occupy territory. So this kind of gives a flavour of what my, my book's about and where that's going. Um, how realistic my reconstructed conversation is, I'll, I'll almost certainly never know. Back to, to Binet, Laurent Binet. Above the line here, he recounts one conversation Heydrich had, so RH is Heydrich, so the SS number two to, to Himmler. Um, and the rising star, a generation younger than, than Hitler, seen as, as the next generation, the next leader um, of, of the Third Reich, perhaps come the 1960s or 50s or whenever um, Hitler would uh, die naturally if things went to plan from the Nazis' point of view. The conversations with his subordinate, a guy called Alfred Naujox, who started World War II, he faked a Polish attack on a German radio station, so just over the border inside Germany, to, so the Nazis could justify invading Poland. Um, of course, they were trying to do that, preferably without Britain and France intervening. They didn't intervene over Czechoslovakia. Why should they care about Poland? Um, and so the conversation above the line, that's taken from the Nuremberg uh, trials. So that's taken, you know, it's recorded as a you know, historical primary source, word for word, uh, what happened. But now Jox, is a, he's a, a colourful character and a very... Uh, unreliable one. So Binet, below the line, creates his own version. It's just a snippet of it. Um, just the, the final line from, from Heydrich gets, gets the point across of how Binet thinks this is far more realistic than the language that um, is said to have happened above. So Binet's now, now saying that if he was writing this as, as a novelist, he feels at least that he would be writing this more realistically than the actual primary source of the only witness who, to that conversation, Heydrich being killed in 1942. So the, the only witness says it happens like this. But obviously there's problems when you're relying on, on witnesses, full stop, as we know, but relying on one, one known to be untrustworthy in the history of, of, of lying, to say the least. Um, it, it raises some interesting questions. Can, is it possible? Can the historical novelist at times perhaps get closer to reality um, than the sort of um, straight down the line historian? I say, slightly aware of the history professor in the room. <laughs> um, okay. In fact, Binet later admits in, in his uh, uh, book that um, when he comes across different versions of a story, this isn't particularly applying to this conversation now, but when he comes across different versions of what happened, different versions of an anecdote of something that happened surrounding Heydrich, sometimes he allows himself to decide which version is going to be true. 
I mean, again, I know historians would take a rigorous approach to coming to those decisions, but that, they've still got to come to them, generally. By the way, um, I was taken on a sort of behind the scenes tour at the museum there. And as, as from a very young age, I went to this museum and I saw this, this Diplodocus and everything else and just wowed by it. And um, yeah, I was told on that tour that it's a, it's a complete fake, as most of the stuff that you see there is. <laughs> the more impressive it looks anyway, the more likely it's a fake. In some cases, they have the real thing, not the whole Diplodocus, but in some other cases, they've got the whole thing behind the scenes. They would never put it out on display. Some of, the, some of them are worth 50 million uh, pounds. Um, so it just made me think, well, if, if kind of the, the scientists working uh, at the museum can get away with that, I mean, what can a historical novelist get away with? Skipping a little bit now, but hopefully in a couple, within a couple of slides, it'll, the point will hopefully will be clear. Um, change of scene, a travel piece I wrote for the SCMP uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is uh, Perugia in Italy, and the way I write the article, I've got a, I've got a date at 9 o'clock with Alicia. Um, I've got three hours uh, on my hands, first of, all, first of all. I'm just arriving at the north end of the city. It's a walled medieval city, um, and I'm meeting her at the south end. So the article is written as me wandering through the city and you know, having dinner and commenting on the food, commenting on the architecture from... A, Etruscans onwards, stumbling on a concert uh, in a piazza here, and I make my way make my way down to the the south end of the city. And when you get there, as the next slide will suggest, it's a bit like I think medieval mid levels. And this is from the end, this is the end of the article. While descending the final section of the escalator, I endeavour to practice my pigeon Italian. The overly helpful locals answer my "Dove Alicia" in fluent English. Competing with heavy hitters, the final paragraph, competing with heavy hitters Rome, Florence, and nearby Assisi for tourists is no easy task. Yet Perugia is so delightfully laid back, one wonders whether it is in fact trying very hard. Before today, I was as unaware of Perugia's charms as I was of those belonging to tonight's star attraction at the open air uh, Santa Giuliana Arena. Alicia Key's jubilant introduction sums up my thoughts precisely. Well, hello, Perugia. It's good to be here. She rolled her R beautifully. I can't do that, unfortunately. Um, so this, again, uh, nonfiction, uh, yeah, journalism. Does it matter that I never made that walk in one go? I've been to all the places I wrote about, of course, several times. I got different ideas for what I wrote in the article, from, actually from different holidays, from different trips. Uh, I did go to the concert, but I was there with my wife um, and was on a holiday with her. So I'm suggesting at the beginning of the article, I got a date with Alicia, and several friends contacted me and saying that, that, that well, they were wondering what was going on there. Of course, they know me. I, I wonder whether other readers would be attracted in that way. Is it, is it, is it a devious kind of, you know, pull, this, this, this date with Alicia? D does it matter that, um, and it's not just me, in case you were wondering, you know, this, is, this is normal in journalism, that it wouldn't be exactly uh, necessarily as happened, but of course they would have gone to those places and experienced those things, but not necessarily in that order or at that uh, specific hour. So I said earlier that fiction may distort, but then so does non-fiction. Yeah, often we just, we just don't know what, what happened. Flicking back, of course, to, to Hyd this is Heydrich in Prague, in Prague Castle. The historical record doesn't tell us what happened next in this photo. These are a medieval uh, crown and scepter from uh, Saint King and Saint uh, Wenceslas. And the legend goes that if any usurper puts the crown on their head, they'll be dead within a year. So this is uh, in 1941, autumn 1941. Um, now, based purely on his gut instincts about Heydrich's character, Binet, Lauren Binet thinks that Heydrich wouldn't have tried on the crown, so he didn't try on the crown, but he would have picked up the scepter. I don't know if it's because his fingers are so close to it there or, 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 or why Binet went with that, but that, that was his conclusion, just based on his instincts and what he knows about Heydrich's character. But again, you can read that differently. I mean, Heydrich's character, for me, would be fairly in keeping with putting a crown on his head. 
So, of course, I put that in my novel. How, how could I not? Um, when it's, there's no evidence that it, that, it, that, it, that it didn't happen. I didn't actually write it as a scene, as if it happened. I had a character tell another character that he saw it happen. So it's a slight step removed there. Um, can we trust that character? Hydric, of course, fulfilled the second part of the, of the, of the legend, and he was dead within a year. Um, we'll, we'll probably never know whether he actually put the crown on his head or not. So historians and novelists have the problem of um, how do we know the character of real historical figures, like Hydric, for example. I know of no complementary account of, of Hydric yet. Was he really an all-bad Richard III figure? Oh, except wait, Richard III it isn't so bad. He's making a comeback at the moment. The Ricardian Society, in particular in the UK, since Richard III was found in a car park in Leicester last year, he was recently reburied. 30,000 people lining the streets of his funeral uh, procession. Even Hitler had a warm side of his character, according to parts of the movie Downfall where he was kind to the secretary, secretaries, his secretaries, and he was affectionate with, with animals, with dogs. So I'm inclined to think if Hitler and Richard III can make a comeback, and for Richard III, that's after 400 years of lambasting from Shakespeare onwards, then perhaps even Heydrich may be reinterpreted one day, because uh, history is never finished with anyone. Moving on to, to settings. Um, from character to settings. To write a scene, a uh, historical novel, you've got to know your, your setting, of course. And the other day I went from home in Sai Kung down to Aberdeen uh, for research on my, the novel I'm writing at the moment. It's about Hong Kong during World War II. And I've written about a third of, about 25,000 words, which will probably be about a third of it, but we'll see. And I'd, I've already written about the motor torpedo boat escape from Aberdeen Harbour. And I'd written scenes in Aberdeen from, from what I've read. Of course, I've been to Aberdeen before, but probably not for a, a couple of years. Um, but I thought, you can't, I can't write this and not actually go there, um, looking precisely at, you know, at what I can that's, that's in the scene. But of course, Aberdeen and Apley Chow, which is also um, what I've written about, they're so different today. I, I question how much, it, how much you can gain from, from, being, from being there. Um, they've changed so much. But uh, for my first novel, I was writing about Warsaw. It's the, the, the girl on the cover is, is my gran, or at least the character is, when she was a teenager. Um, she's not Jewish, um, so for, because of her family's uh, connections, very kind of high-ranking connections. They knew they were going to be persecuted by the SS, and she had to get out of, of Warsaw after the war started. My gran and and Dita here, um, and so I obviously went to uh, went to Warsaw, but also read up on it uh, because, of course, it was flattened during World War II. So I had to know what it was like. The novel begins just before, just before the war begins. So I had to know what it was like before. Um, before it was flattened. So obviously, cities can change very quick, as we very much know here. Um, so here's, here's the opening of my novel. Her mind alive with the words she had overheard last night, Dita emerged onto the broad steps of the library and shielded her eyes from the lowering sun. She tied up her dark hair, pulled her socks to her knees, and walked down the steps. Her father was so grey and sedate, it was hard to imagine a phrase less likely to emerge from his lips than your chance to kill. A few lines later. A Baroque city where grand buildings rose above an all-encompassing street life. Her father labelled Warsaw the Paris of the East. It was both strange and natural that the cafes all along, Krakowski, uh, Pranmici, crammed with soldiers in freshly pressed uniforms, were enjoying better business than usual. This is uh, on the eve of war. People ate, drank, and laughed, clinging to norma normality. The distant buzz in the sky, outdone by the hum of humanity on the ground. And then, just finally, a couple of lines later, she darted across the thoroughfare leading off to Kibbert's Bridge, where horse carts mingled with teeming trams and coughing motor cars. Across the cobbled square ahead, the whitewashed royal palace hunkered down in the five o'clock sun. So here's the, the whitewashed royal palace in autumn 1939, as, as, when it's attacked by the Nazis. And this is it after the fire goes out, and you can see how it had these kind of pirouette 
uh, towers that have one on this corner as well. So there's a lot of change there. And this uh, a gratuitous shot of my son. This is um, when uh, we went there, my family with me, obviously. Uh, the, the Royal Palace on the right there. You'll kind of be wondering how that works, and I'll tell you more in a moment. Because Warsaw was, Warsaw was painstakingly reconstructed after the Second World War. The whole historic centre, brick by brick, um, put together. So oh, I just wanted to say here how this is the other side of the, of the square. So on the left, on the left of this picture, um, is the royal palace that we see there on the right. Um, but yeah, buildings like, like these that look 300 years old are about 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old in some cases. And the royal castle as well. And of course, there are inaccuracies. I say it was put back painstakingly together precisely, and this is how historians describe it to me when I, when I met them in, in Warsaw as well. And they, were, they were very helpful. Um, but uh, when I realized that although the royal palace was architecturally painstakingly put back exactly as it was, you know, the effect, the windows and the effects around them and so on, uh, the, the roofing, and as I say, that tower would have been the same, and that's the same. Everything's the same, except the colour. And I easily could have, uh, of course, just, uh, just, just got that wrong in, in my novel. And it just makes me think, I, I surely, uh, of course, I've, I have got things wrong. What, what have I got wrong that I'm not aware of? By the way, that picture, I took that picture. So when I showed you the, this version, I took it, I just put a different filter on it at the time. Just to ho hopefully you were thinking I didn't take that. Hopefully you were thinking that was a historic photo. And again, you, you, know, you can't be sure. Um, uh, it is remarkable how, how Warsaw to me is just such a remarkable city today. There's um, I won't go into this. I won't show you this for you know, take up more time. But um, one of the sources I used was was color footage of Warsaw in the 1930s on a you know, video camera. And it's really interesting to see, of course. But what, what you don't see is also you know, important. It's very limited. I was almost going to show you this, but it's very limited. The detail, the quality, it's obviously it's not HD. And um, you know, with Google Earth today, you can go and look at the mosaics you know, just from your computer in Prague as well, where there's, there's, far, there's far more of them. I, you know, I, was, I was doing that, and Prague wasn't. Uh, destroyed during World War II, so I, I knew I could rely on that. Although, of course, I, I, I went there as well. Um, so, I tend to write scenes before I go there. So I had a very eerie experience. I'd never been in this crypt. I'll explain the story a bit for the, those who aren't familiar in, in, in a moment. Um, I'd never been there before, but I'd written a scene there. So when I was in there, I, I, I had been there before, for sure. I, I felt like I had. I felt more familiar to me than lots of places where I have actually physically been to. Um, of course, it made me adjust a couple of, it made me adjust some things that, that, that I wrote. So Heydrich's assassins, or would-be assassins, because um, he survives um, the attempted uh, shooting and, and bombing um, of him and his car, I'll show you a picture later. The assassins then go to this church in the center of Prague and hide down in the crypt at the bottom. There's seven paratroopers, uh, Czech paratroopers who were trained in Britain by, by SOE, Special Operations Executive, dropped into Bohemia and they all met up here. They weren't actually all involved in this particular op, others had different ops, but the seven of them found themselves here. So at any one time, over the period of a couple of weeks that they spent here, there would be three or four of them downstairs resting here, and there'd be three or four above in the, in the main body of the church, and particularly higher up, sort of on lookout. And the two were, were separated. The, the crypt was as hidden as it could be. There, were, there was a stepped entrance just on the right of the bottom right photograph. You can maybe just see some steps. Um, there was a stepped entrance. Um, so that, would, that appears under the altar. But when, when you're up above in the church, that you can see no, no sign of that. You need to move back the carpet and remove um, a stone slab from the, fr from the floor. So essentially, they're, they're very separate. The idea being that the, if they're just, some are discovered upstairs, those downstairs may, you know, may not be discovered. 
so we're going to join a non-fiction character, all, all seven. I mention all seven, but I focus on two. And from the, I do it from the point of view of one in my, in my novel, and that one is Joseph uh, Gabchik. Through the small window high up the wall of the crypt, the rumble of a heavy vehicle squeaking to a halt. So I heard the rumble of a heavy vehicle squeaked to a halt. The newspapers had publicised that the Nazis had set today, June 18th, as the end of their amnesty period for information about the assassins. It was a 10 million crown uh, reward for each assassin. Nobody would risk coming forward after that, because the Nazis had said, you have to come forward. If you come forward up to today, you won't get into trouble for withholding information. But if you leave it till later, you will. So survive today, back to the novel, survive today, and tomorrow promise deliverance. The Americans and Russians would win the war. The promise of a better life beckoned. And then just a little later in the same. So Gabchik is uh, resting on one of these um, uh, sort of recesses here that were meant for coffins. Uh, the gas stove on the floor below gave a constant hiss and a low light, but only a hint of warmth. Joseph Gabchik reached his hand up from under the blanket and ran it across the curved, granulated stone 20 centimetres above his eyes. Grit fell onto his face. There had been consequences beyond comprehension. All 173 of the village men had been killed. All women and children were carted away to wither and die in a camp. The village had been burned to the ground. The Nazis had dug up each and every tombstone and coffin in the cemetery. They had even uprooted every tree. Life was extinguished from the present, the past, the future. Gabchik wiped moisture from his eyes with the back of each hand. This photograph, two photographs, one taken just before May 1942 and one taken soon after it. So obviously the top photos before. Lidice, um, a village 20, 30 miles out of Prague that Gabchik never went to. None of the paratroopers ever visited it. But what, obviously what I read is, is what happened. And you, you go there today and uh, it's... It's a lot like the bottom photograph, but with memorials and with more, with more trees and, and, and a museum. And for a long time, it wasn't known why. Why Lodice? Why did the Nazis take out their revenge for Heydrich's, uh, at this stage, attempted assassination um, on Lodice? For writing a novel, it doesn't necessarily matter. It does, of course, depend on what you're trying to say in the novel. But for my novel, the, the reason why uh, didn't didn't matter for the for the story, but it's an interesting story, um, if only a, an aside. Um, recently, Czech historians have unearthed the truth as as we as the truth as we know it now. Of course, there could be something that comes along later and and changes history uh, as we know it can happen. But um, the assassins were not connected to the village. The truth is, Lidice was chosen because of illicit sex. An adulterer wrote to his lover, seeking a heroic exit from the, their affair. Uh, so he gave the impression he was involved in patriotic activities for the resistance, and that that would force him away from her. This letter was intercepted, and the mail, it was sent to where she worked, a factory she worked at, and the boss intercepted it, opened it, gave it to the Gestapo. The couple were brought in for questioning, and desperate to give the Gestapo something they wanted to hear, um, the, the, the man, the adulterer man, said uh, he knew of uh, a Czech who ca comes from the village of Lidice who's fighting in Britain's armed forces now. Uh, he left Lidice some time earlier. And so the Gestapo followed that lead. It was, a, it was a false lead, but they were determined to take out their vengeance somewhere, and so the fate of Lidice had been decided. Footsteps from my novel again. Footsteps shuffled along the street outside. Gabchek shimmied his arms and head out of his recess and dropped his palms to the stone floor of the crypt. Then it began, a rap of gunfire pattered down from the church above. Jan would be up there with Bublik and Opolka, 
armed like the lads downstairs, only with pistols. Upstairs, Jan Kubis, who had been so close to Kamchek through so many battles over the years, um, now he may as well have been in a different theatre of war. Um, I mentioned the, the, the pistols there. I, I, I went to the Military History Institute in Prague, which is the, the un, undisputed custodian of this, this, this history, um, the assassination of Prague and, and Czech resistance as, as a whole. And uh, they informed me that all, all the movies, novels, and historians' accounts who spoke uh, refer to machine guns, Sten guns, inside the church um, was fiction. So just one example. When I got to Prague, I had to rewrite that. I had these guys with, with machine guns um, because of what I'd read from the from the well from what I thought were the were the top historians. The top historians, it turns out, hadn't. Trans, hadn't translated into English yet, or at least hadn't published a book. They've published a sort of 100-page um, booklet that I, that I got hold of there, and that is in English. Uh, so again, the Czech historians were just, were just far ahead of the, of the rest of the world, certainly the English-speaking world, English-writing world. I was criticized, um, since the book's come out, for having too many characters in the church. I mean, there were seven paratroopers there, so I was always going to have seven, and I was going to make sure they all, all their real names got a, got a mention at some point. But I do focus on, on uh, Jan Kubis and Joseph Gabcek, and particularly on, on Gabcek, who were the two. One of them, uh, Gabcek, with a Sten gun, tries to shoot Heydrich in his car, and um, Kubis, Jan Kubis throws a grenade. So they're the two central characters. And... Okay, in fact, it's probably a good time. So three weeks or so before the, the shootout in the, uh, that's coming in the, in, the, in the church there, this is the scene of the, the assassination. It looks very different in Prague today, although the curve of the road is still there, but not a lot else. And so this is shortly afterwards. This is Heydrich's open-top car. There was no... He had a driver who obviously had a pistol, an SS driver, but other than that, he had no guards, he had no other escorting vehicles, open top, it's not an armoured car. Um, and uh, Gabcek stood on this corner, knowing the car would have to slow down, um, and uh, had a, a Sten, gun, Sten gun under his raincoat on a hot day in May, uh, and pulled it out. But before we sort of come back to that, I should say, first of all, that I don't always stick to um, the most probable reality in my historical novels. I, I, I tend to, but I can't say that I always do. So here, I wrote this scene as I read it from historians, and particularly a leading Czech historian called Miroslav Ivanov, um, writing in the sort of last three decades of the 20th century. Um, and he wrote this... Uh, as, among other historians um, and um, uh, fiction accounts, he wrote this as Gabcek's girlfriend, Labina, driving ahead in a separate car, driving ahead of Heydrich with a, a system where if she had her hat on her head, there was a, another car of guards. Occasionally, he would have a second car. Um, and if there was no hat on the head, there were no extra security. There's just the two guys you'd see in the car. So, so she obviously would have pulled out a head of Heydrich's car and come around this bend where Gamcheck was and on the other side of the road was, was Cubis out of picture. Um, she would have come around the, the bend above them and that's the way I wrote it. And I got to Prague, I was told that didn't happen. But then he slightly adjusted what he, what he said. A guy called, um, a historian called Zednik Spitalnik, uh, who's been incredibly helpful um, in proofreading, not just answering my questions and taking me around places, but in proofreading every th draft and after draft of these chapters. And um, he then he corrected himself and he, and he said that, well, it's unlikely that it happened. There's no evidence that it did happen. There's no evidence that it didn't. And because it helped with my characterization, Gabcek had this girlfriend, Cubis had a girlfriend uh, as well, and in both cases they had serious uh, plans um, for after the war, should they survive, you know, to get married. Cubis' girlfriend, we think, was pregnant. Uh, so I wanted to, to get that across, and of course, in the way I write it up, I won't, I won't read it uh, all here now, but as Cubis, uh, sorry, as Gabcik, Joseph Gabcik has stood there waiting, at times he's thinking about that future, and he's thinking about that girl, and then she comes past. So 
we get to know the real Gabcek better by me putting Labina, his girlfriend, in this scene, although, and some historians today was, would have still written it that way, even, you know, even this century accounts have written it that way. Um, it's just that in, in Prague, in what I would consider the top place, they say there's no evidence that, that it happened. So of course that's what historians would do. If there's no evidence for it, you take it out. You can't suggest it might have happened if there's no evidence for, for that. Where Ivan have got that from, the, the historian, the leading historian who, who put that in there, um, we're not too sure. Oh, I'm not too sure. Okay. Um, interestingly, Binet, who is uh, forever kind of critical of historical novel, novels, really, although he sets out to write one, he ends up not writing one. He ends up writing this book about writing a historical novel, Laurent Binet. Um, he uh, says that he um, leaned upon Miroslav Ivanov more than any other historian in his research. Now, that doesn't say that he didn't spot his inaccuracies, but there are some that he didn't spot, at, at least according to what I've been told by the historians at the Military History Institute. So Binet has stated certain things in his book as, as facts, which aren't true. I'm sure like, we all get things wrong, or like there are just different interpretations of, of history. Perhaps I felt like Ivanov, the professional historian, gave me an author's license, but perhaps I shouldn't have felt like that. I don't know. Um, so this is where the, the historians in Prague were saying there's no evidence for this. Um, the novelist can do what the historian can't. And my bottom line was, so uh, is there evidence to prove this didn't happen? That's not, I could say, the approach I would take on every scene, but I, I, I did that. And, and perhaps there's some value in historical novelists doing that. Of course, they're doing a different job to historians. Um, uh, and if they, don't, if they don't do that, perhaps we're left with a minimalist story of the past at times, if nobody ever fills the gaps. So coming towards a conclusion now. Um, two final quotes from, from Binet, and then a, a, couple, a couple of slides to round off after this. Uh, people have questioned how I could know that the German commissioner who arrested the son of a brave woman resistance fighter was smiling. But I do know. I had the testimony of the translator who worked with the Germans. So Binet writes up these scenes and using the dialogue as the witnesses said, and in, in this case using the facial expression as a witness said, and then afterwards he's kind of, you know, examined how do we know this. Um, but I still question that. He's got the testimony of one person who says, so a Czech translator, uh, who years later said that a German in a particular situation, a Nazi, the enemy, was smiling as they arrested a Czech resistance fighter. I mean, whether that's honestly how they remembered it, the, you know, the problems of memory, uh, of course. Um, yeah, maybe it happened like that, but relying on it, uh, uh, for sure. Um, slightly undermines some of the, I think, really valid and good points that Binet does, does say. So I'm being a little harsh here and, and picking out things, maybe because it's more interesting at times to disagree with him. But he says, this is what I think. Inventing a character in order to understand historical facts is like fabricating evidence. Um, well, first of all, in reaction to that, we, obviously we, we must remember fiction's job is different. A novelist's job is different to a historian's job, as I said uh, earlier. Also, maybe as a slight tangent, we've got to remember that some of the examples I've given, the quiet American, um, you could take All Quiet on the Western Front, um, you could take Homage to Catalonia, Farewell to Arms. Um, I would say these do contribute to the historic uh, record, certainly to the narrative, but of course they're not historical novels. They're contemporary. They were written at that time and place by people who'd experienced those things, who were involved in those wars, etc. Um, those people who were writing them, those authors, you know, Hemingway, Orwell, uh, Green, were uh, primary sources themselves. But some novels, um, today, modern novels, um, usually ones far less remarkable than the, all those other examples, than, um, those aforementioned works, some novels can bring a greater understanding, maybe not facts, but a greater understanding, and bring that understanding perhaps to a wider group of people. Uh, memoirs of a geisha, I, I, you know, it doesn't, it's not worthy of mention with, with all those other works that I just said, but it does expose an otherwise um, unknown culture and, and time uh, to many of us who otherwise you know, wouldn't have, wouldn't have um, 
certainly wouldn't have readily, easily been able to, to learn that history. And perhaps we would have had to learn Japanese to really have got to know it even as well as that, that novel and that novelist. So I'd say, uh, yeah, coming uh, t towards an end, historians do the hard work of unearthing and presenting sources of evidence. Novelists take what the historian's done, more often than not, that's, uh, and, and often make it, or can make it at times, perhaps not often, but can make it more tangible for, for certain people at least, for many people. Um, I want to finish in, in Paris, partly because a big chunk of my book set, uh, set there is where my, my teenage gran um, ended up to, but then so did the Nazis soon after her, so she had to stay one step ahead, just as Dieter uh, endeavours to, and um, to get the last boat from Bordeaux. And the way my gran, my gran's still alive, uh, living in the south of England, where she told it to me as she got on the last uh, boat and as it pulled away from Bordeaux, she saw the Germans arrive, setting up their, their um, weaponry, the big you know, artillery on the, uh, on the kind of the cliff top. And, it, and a few minutes later, of course, there's a big ship, it's a, a merchant ship, that, um, pull, pulls out to sea. I don't know how far out it is, but she describes the shells um, firing and exploding in the water around her and luckily not hitting the ship. And I've read, uh, there's a, an account called, the, a memoir called The Last Boat from Bordeaux, which someone else has, uh, has written, and I've read, I've read that as well, and uh, builds a similar picture. And uh, the one, one reviewer, professional reviewer, criticised me for um, not being historically accurate, because how could such a big ship possibly escape at that time and, and make, it to, make it to Britain? Well, there's the account, the, uh, the, the book I refer to, The Last Boat from Bordeaux, the person who wrote it was on that boat. My grandmother was on that boat, and she wouldn't have made it if, if the boat had got destroyed. Um, so it was an odd thing to pick on. There are other things in the book which are more up for debate, I felt, than, than, than that. But uh, maybe I'm being overly defensive there. Um, but the, actually, the main reason I want to take us to Paris, and this is Paris in 1940 here, was because I want to finish with, with this guy. Um, it's one of my favourite books, Hemingway's memoir, A, Mo A Movable Feast. And this is his years living in Paris just before World War II. He's not, he doesn't stay during the war. Um, he's hanging out, he's there with his young family, and he's hanging out with every expat worth knowing. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, Ford Maddox Ford, and Pablo Picasso, who gets, uh, makes a bit of a cameo in my novel, briefly. Um, and many of these people receive, as well as compliments at times, they receive cutting criticism from Hemingway in, his, in A Movable Feast, in his memoir. Uh, but we see the good times the, the, in, this, in his memoir, the Roaring Twenties in Paris, but we also see the breakdown of his marriage. But perhaps most interestingly for the subject matter today, there's a note at the end of A Movable Feast, um, which, as I've said, is, 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 I would think, undeniably a memoir more than anything. But the note declares, it was necessary to write this as fiction rather than as fact. I don't know if he was worried that uh, he's going to get sued, um, but as all historians would know, memoirs or autobiographies should be treated as works of fiction, by and large. So, overall, the, the lines between fiction and non-fiction are blurred, um, and the waters of truth are muddied. And I'm going to give Hemingway the last word. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm sure there are many questions, so let me just kick off uh, with the first one or, or two. Um, is the end product what you set out to achieve? Question one. And along the way, did you find yourself struggling or was there a tension between the, the fiction and the history and you found yourself having to pull yourself back from one side or the other? Yeah, um, second question first. Of course, yeah, there's a, t a tension. I'm, I'm history, I studied undergrad history and, and politics and uh, I've taught history for 15 years. So I wanted to be true to the history, I wanted to be true to my grand story, um, at least the, the parts of it that I've, 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 I've kind of mentioned, her, her journey across Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to be true to, to the reality. And there is a tension, and I hope some of the examples I gave kind of, kind of showed that. But when the history is so um, exciting, and there's so much going on there, you, know, you just want to go with the history almost every time. The one time I didn't is that 
when the, in the actual scene on the hairpin bend, um, the stem gun that Gamcheck pulled up, it jammed. And I wrote it like that, that it, that it jammed. But it does, now it depends which historians you believe. But certainly the drivers, the SS driver, a guy called Klein, his revolver also jammed. Now I'm thinking, if I write that, are you going to believe it? And to other, according to other, and that certainly happened, those two guns. But a third, there's a th also, some historians say that when Heydrich, who was slightly injured, but drew his gun and, and um, later fired shots, but when he pulled it on Gabchik, that that jammed as well. You can't write that in fiction. No one's going to believe it. So, yeah, I had to find a way around these things, but still, still making it as exciting as possible. And now I forgot on your first question, sorry. <laughs> what you set out to achieve. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, I, I suppose when I really started, I started probably f over 15 years ago when I interviewed my gran. I, I'd grown up with her story, um, so I, I already knew it, but I actually thought I wanted to write it down. So that was probably 16, 17 years ago, and I interviewed her, and I obviously still got the notes, and I, I wrote, wrote down a, an account of her, of her story. Um, and I kind of felt one day I'm going to do something with this. Because there's always one day. Um, and so when I started writing the novel was 2008, um, when more parts of the story just came into my mind in the middle of the night on holiday. I just got up at 2 AM, couldn't sleep, and started writing stuff down. And uh, so at that point, at either of those points, I didn't know how it was going to end and, and so on. I didn't know where it was entirely where it was going to go. So it does depend on the question. It depends you know, where, where you stop it. Um, but within, once we got to so four or five years ago from now, yeah, it's, 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 it's come out, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty pleased with it. I found a typo the other day. I'm not so pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second novel, um, it's, it's a similar, similarly themed uh, historical novel. Yeah, as I've got, I've got sort of four or five slides on, on the end here. Um, yeah, similarly themed, similar time period. During the Battle of Hong Kong, a little before that, the Battle of Hong Kong, and I think it's going to go a little after. And there, what I focused on so far, um, special operations again, British special operations uh, executive had agents in Hong Kong working behind the lines. Um, well, once the battle kind of came to Hong Kong, they were working behind the lines. Before that, they were planning different types of sabotage and and so on. So I, I follow their their path, and some of those guys also end up after they. Once Kowloon's taken over by the Japanese, these special operations guys are just, um, you know, just swimming across the harbour and sticking explosives on, onto Japanese um, boats and so on, swimming back and then and blowing, blowing stuff up. Um, once that they've kind of finished with that and, and Hong Kong is, is lost, some of those guys end up on one of these five motor torpedo boats together with Admiral, Admiral Chan Chak. Um, he's in a later picture. I should probably yeah, move through these. Because what I've been saying kind of moves beyond this. Oh, there he is on the left there. And he was the, the Chinese government, the nationalist government of China's highest ranking um, you know, person in, in Hong Kong. So he was the VIP on, these, on, on this escape. And he was a, a very colorful character, about five foot one or two tall. He's got one leg. And as you may be able to see there. But he was going around during the Battle of Hong Kong dealing with um, any kind of fifth columnists um, dealing with triads who were um, trying to you know, steal things either for their own gain, some were already in the pay of the, of the Japanese. And he was just going around and, you know, rightly or wrongly, going, walking into rooms either on his own or with one other guy and, and, and just shooting up a room. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's the story of, of all of that and, and their escape. But I think where well, I'm going to go next is going to say more about civilians in Hong Kong, um, including the, the Chinese resistance, in, uh, particularly in Sai Kung, and also the camp in Stanley. There's different ways I'm, uh, I'm looking at, at, at working that in that relates to this story. Great, great. So questions from the audience, please. <laughs> I'm pretty certain I know someone who <laughs> has a question. Peter Kunick, please. Thanks, Paul. Um, Obviously, veracity is very important in a historical novel, and I'm a great fan of historical novels, by the way. Um, but um, in order to get that veracity, um, sometimes you have to go beyond the bounds of what we would consider to be the truth in the past. And one of the things that annoys me most about 16th century 
uh, historical novels or novels set in the 16th century is that you have to invent the characteristics of those people and you need various agents provocateurs who will do certain things in the action and quite often a novelist will choose a person who will do a particular act or who will say particular things. So you're actually ascribing these, these particular actions or, or features to a, a real person in the past. I've been very interested recently to reread a lot of Anthony Trollope. And what you find with Trollope, who's writing 10 years after the, the dates that he's, uh, he's actually dealing with, is that the only person in his novels who is real is the Queen, Queen Victoria, <laughs> and she doesn't figure in the novels at all. Everyone else is invented from the Prime Minister down to all of the uh, people who are actors in these novels. That doesn't take away from the veracity mm. of everything that's happening. And I just wonder why it is that in the 19th century, novelists were quite happily writing historical novels uh, which didn't require veracity that relies upon real characters, whereas it seems to me today every historical novel clamours after veracity by stacking the novel with real characters, real names, as if that is the only way that you can create this veracity. Yeah, I think the second part of the question is kind of harder to answer, but if, if Trollope's writing ten years after the events, then I would say it's not a historical novel, it's contemporary. He's writing that time and place, and if he, he'll be writing about people who are still alive um, if he used non-fiction characters. So I imagine that's a big reason why he would uh, stick to, to fictitious characters. Um, but um, one element, of a big element in the novel, which is actually on the picture, but I didn't mention to try and slim things down, another part of uh, the story is the RAF story from the beginning of World War II and Britain's first military operation of any type in World War II, which was on day two of Britain's war. It's an RAF attack on a German naval base. And in that, I've put entirely yeah, fictitious characters, and I've kind of had fun with that side of things. Um, but then you'll probably ask me why have I done that there and then not somewhere else. I, I, I don't know if I have a, an answer to that. But my, well, maybe I do. Maybe the, the characters with the assassination, the characters are already almost written for you. I, and it, will, it would also seem, for, for the bravery they showed and for the situation they were in and for the hero status they have, at least in, in, in the Czech Republic and, Czech, and Slovakia, um, I don't think I could write them out of, write them out of history. Um, there, there aren't such singular characters here. Of course, they're equally brave people and so on, uh, flying the planes, but somehow it feels you can represent them, embody them in the characters that you write. Uh, to find a singular character who, who was, was there, there's very little resources at all on the first operation, Britain's first operation of, of the war. So to then go a step further and expect to, to be able to find one character to focus on, um, yeah, would, would, would make it well, not just more difficult, but I don't, I don't think you could do it with the sources we've got. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure that doesn't fully answer your question, but that's my, my best shot at it. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions? You're not a very lively lot, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Peter, you got any other questions? It's okay. I know you are. I know you are. So let's hold Peter off and give everybody else a chance first. Nothing, Zara? Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Good, good, good. Hi, Mr. Letters. Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so this has obviously been a work in the making for multiple years. Um, I'll stand it until the point when you interviewed your grandmother about all this. You said you want to do something, and I'm sure a lot of information has been um, researched into this. Um, and I'm just wondering, just in terms of, because um, ov there's obviously fictitious elements to this, mm. um, but overall it is a historical novel. Um, as there, was there any, in terms of when you were doing your research on you know, background, your personal research and secondary research and all that, was there anything, such as your example about the last boat in Bordeaux, which, which um, that account, stems directly in parallel with your grandmother. Was there any other point of research that came as maybe, not necessarily a shock, but did, um, did surprise you in any way? <coughs> in any way, sorry. 
Well, um, yeah, I think su surprises all the way through. Uh, less on my grandmother's story, because I'd, I, I can't remember how young I was when I heard it, but I'd heard the same story so many times, I was really just, just writing it down. But certainly the, yeah, the examples I gave on the assassination, the details of that, and the, and the arguments between the historians. And you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I've just sided with the Prague's Military History Institute. I feel confident, but may, maybe, I'm, you know, maybe I'm wrong to do that. Maybe some of the other historians who are still very much writing in this field um, you know, would, would, would disagree. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with uh, another one, certainly on my, my grand side of it. I should say, I suppose because of the nature of the talk, I emphasize the, the non-fiction side of it more. Um, my, my, the first half of Dieter's story in this book, so the first half of the, of the novel, um, maybe just less than a half actually, um, is my grand story. But then from when they both get to the UK, um, it changes. So my grand um, went on to be a languages teacher, so it's quite possible that she, she would have been a very prime uh, person educationally to be dropped behind enemy lines back into occupied Europe like my character Dieter is. And they were told, of course, never to admit that. And many people who, who did that, who were dropped behind the lines, um, lived to the 1990s, the 2000s, and in some cases, by then, more and more of them were admitting they did it if they lived that long. But many died you know, without admitting that. Um, so it's possible that she did that, but no, she didn't have anything. That would have been beautiful. She'd had a, a gem like that to surprise me with. Did you discover anything new about your grandmother along the journey? I, yes, but it was such a long time ago. She's, she's got dementia now for the last few years. So it was really, it would have been that 16, 17 years ago when I interviewed her. And now we're relying on my memory, <laughs> and I don't trust memories. <laughs> so I don't have a good answer there, sorry. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Seeing as Zane has opened the, the floodgate, so I'll, I'll ask a question. So, um, you know, you've talked a lot about, during, especially during this talk, about, you know, when you write a historical novel, balancing fictitious and non -fictitious, fictitious elements and the troubles with that, you know. The, people not listening to you or agreeing with what you say or whatnot. But I just finished uh, reading Taipan mm. for the first time, and it's become one of my favorite books. Can you talk about the other side, how, how fun it is in a way, you know, almost to balance these two elements, not have it hold you back? Yes, I think you know, there's definitely a sense that the historical novelist gets to, gets to have more fun, perhaps, than if you were being strictly a hist historian about it. And you can when you're filling in those gaps and you can, you can, make, um, you can make things happen. So there's uh, the, some of the relationships between the characters. I'm pausing a bit because anyone's, I know, in fact, I know one or two people in the room who've bought the, the novel. I don't know if they finished it yet. So I don't want to give away the, kind of the twists and the turns, but relationships between characters in particular, you can have a lot of uh, fun with. Um, and you, you can play on a coincidence or two, but if you take that too far, of course, you're going to lose your, your audience. But yeah, it's great the way you can, you can also draw different bits of history together. Um, so it, another feature in the novel is how in Britain, MI5, the security services there, managed to round up all of the German spies who were dropped in, in Britain. And they were pretty arrogant at the time to say that they, we've got them all, but it turns out the historians would agree that they have, they did get them all. Um, but I try to get across the relationship between that and what's going on with um, allied spies in Prague in particular. And the relationship between the two, there's a rivalry between the, the Abwa, Abra and the, and the SS. Um, uh, maybe I shouldn't get into it too much, but within the, the Nazi state, there's all sorts of rivalries and characters and the knock-on effects and the relationships between them where we don't know what happened. You can fill the gaps. So sure, yeah, I definitely ha had fun uh, doing that and, on the, and the characterization side of it, which I haven't said um, a, a lot about, her relationship with uh, a member of the, of the crew of the Blenheim bomber, bomber and things which aren't as you would, would assume. Maybe I'm being too tight with the information here, but for anyone who reads it, I don't want to give away the, the, the twist, twists and turns. Peter? You're still bristling. <laughs> Always bristling. Um, I, I guess, um, well, I think we historians would have ethical qualms about taking a real character, placing her story in a novel, 
and then continuing the story um, as a as a purely fictional yeah. story. And I just wonder for you as a as a grandson, um, how do you feel about the fact that it's your grandmother? That well, you, you know, I, I don't present her. She's got a different name. Uh, my grandma's called Sabina. Um, I don't present her as a real character. She's obviously not a known uh, historical figure. She's not going to be known to anybody else. I just, in everything that's written in the notes in the book and in the promotion of the book, you know, this character is in, inspired by my grandmother. So that's, that's different. The, my approach to her is very different to the, the uh, Hydrix assassins, where I've tried to be um, you know, s sticking to the, their story as much as possible. But I can totally understand. So what, do, what does she think of it, the fact that she is... Uh, she's got dementia, she's so she, she, she can't. So what does children. her children, what do her children think? Oh, well, yeah, well, obviously, they, yeah, they're very supportive and they love it, but then there's, a, yeah, there's an obvious bias there, so it's hard to know, isn't it? It's OK, if there's no more questions, that's OK. We have time for one more. One more question. Last question. Yes, please, sir. Microphone. I hope you don't take it as an offense. Uh, it's all business. Between the historical novels, readers can have a wide choice out of Wikipedia, History Channel, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic channels. Now, there are always thin lines when we are paying for our cable. Uh, I paid eight ninety nine for your book on my Kindle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was and, cheaper. Uh, <laughs> it's very difficult to clear cut these clean lines, and uh, we always want to see which charlatan is less deceiving. Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Do you mean which historical novelist is it? Yes. Me? Okay, as opposed uh -huh. to the... You have a lot of competitors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, does it make me feel uncomfortable? Not really. I think you know, most people approach it knowing that it's fiction, but then, of course, if they're looking at this, for something on this particular time in history and they're looking for something which is, doesn't divert too strongly from... Um, what we consider to be historical reality, then um, you know, that's what I'm kind of hoping to attract. There's plenty of other novels, you know, certainly set on the assassination of Heydrich, where, which are done either, uh, to either extreme. They've either, they're either really the transcripts of conversations that we've got recorded, or they're kind of pie-in-the-sky accounts of, of, of what happened. Um, I'm not, as far as I know, there, there, there's, not, there's not much out there that's trying to do what I was trying to do. Perhaps Lon Binet was closest, but he ended up deciding not to write a novel about it and writing the, the largely non-fiction book that he wrote. But no, I, it, I, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I'd be more, I'm more bothered when my non-fiction sources, like Wikipedia or any of those TV channels or a newspaper or a, a book, if I feel let down by them on, on, on the reality. But of course, that happens all the time as well. But I've got slightly different expectations there as I guess most readers would have with a novel. So no intended deception then? No, in the notes at the, at the back, I, I, I make clear um, many of the things I've, I've said here. If I do uh, divert from uh, reality, for example, the, the girlfriend being in the car ahead, and then it may well have not happened like that. So I kind of I own up at the end. Not that the New York Times reviewer at the beginning would, uh, would appreciate, that, appreciate that, but then she doesn't have to read it. If, if you don't want to know, you just don't have to read that extra bit at the end. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Microphone. Certain idea will you will it be transformed as a TV series program or movie? I, I, of course, I will. Of course, I would love that. <laughs> Thank you. And um, yeah, influenced by the likes of Graham Greene, I try, I try to write the scenes, imagine them all, you know, on film. That would be wonderful. I just think it'd be very expensive. Um, the, those lots of different locations, and if you're going to be, they've just got a Blenheim bomber back in the sky. There's one in the, you know, in the world, so. To, to, to use that, um, and then there's different aircraft, of course, on different sides later on in the war as well. It'd be very expensive to make, but you know, if you know anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> Any other 
questions or comments for Paul? Well, with that, please join me in thanking Paul. I think it's been a wonderful conversation and, and certainly um, a great expose on fiction and non-fiction and the interaction between the two. And so please, uh, just a very small gift oh, from the library. Thank you very much. So please thank join me. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for having me here, and thank you for, for coming and giving Thanks, out your Paul. time. Thank you so much. If you'd like, if you want a, a signed book, if you've got one already, if you want one signed, then I'll be here. Where will I be? Just over there, if you, if you want one. Oh.